Okay. Yep. Uh, so the I wish I was in Barcelona to give this talk, and uh, Barcelona is one of my very favorite cities, and um, um, three of my children all have extremely nice memories, you know, coming to Barcelona every year, and um, I, it, you know, hopefully uh, in a future event, uh, which is, uh, you know, hopefully not too far in the future that uh, we'll be able to you know, be physically together, and uh, um, these symposiums are never the same without espresso before, right? Uh, so the, you know, the, the uh, I totally miss the espresso that uh, you know, the UBC campus has to offer. So the, the with, without that, uh, those kind of nice uh, amenities, uh, you know, let's focus on some of the technical discussions this year, and hopefully next year we're going to have a you know the huge uh, celebration, you know, the uh, for you know the end of the pandemic. So the um, I'm going to just kind of uh, you know talk about uh, a few things that I hope uh, will be useful uh, for PhD students at the early stage of their career. And uh, this symposium is about uh, sharing your work, but I'm hoping that uh, this talk will also help to help you to shape uh, your future course. So the, uh, as the, the Pep mentioned earlier, you know, the, I have been Yale Path student for 40 years, for zero. Okay, so the, it's it's a long time. And uh, so the, for those of you who know Yale, uh, he would typically give a talk that uh, has only one slide. Any questions? Right, uh, I think many of you have seen this uh, talk, but um, uh, I'm not Yale Pass, so I decided that maybe that's not a good idea. So uh, I'm going to maybe uh, do a more a one who talk, and uh, hopefully that would uh, give you some useful information. So the, um, the kind of the agenda for the day is that uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the compute paradigm, and that's so it's a very very uh, high level, uh, you know, the uh, from a big distance point of view of how compute is kind of uh, changing the world and then how uh, we're uh, shaping our uh, interactions with our world and then shaping the future of our world. And then uh, I will talk about XCT. And uh, uh, I see this as a good example of how a, uh, you know, a PhD uh, research project could have in, in terms of uh, intellectual contribution and impact. And uh, hopefully this will help you to select your own PhD uh, project. And in the meantime, I also like to talk a little bit about that uh, some of the technical uh, breakthroughs that we uh, we made uh, in that journey. And then uh, uh, with uh, talk, I'll talk a little bit about how we are rethinking computer architecture. And uh, that was the primary reason why uh, I retired from the university and joined NVIDIA. And uh, I'm it's, it's really working on how uh, the future of these uh, you know, GPU and system architecture should be changed in the context of a much bigger movement in uh, a sparse computation and uh, huge data. So the, uh, it's, we, we have been uh, witnessing a major paradigm shift uh, in the past, uh, I would say, uh, a century. So in the 20th century, you know, the, uh, many of you were uh, you know, uh, not even uh, you know, uh, born until the very end of the century. And uh, I was born in the middle of the century. And uh, you know, I have, uh, we have witnessed a lot of advancements. And many of these advancements have to do with the uh, event, uh, how, we can, how accurate we can measure things. And uh, so we were able to understand and design and manufacture you know, the things that we can measure. For example, uh, we're able to, you know, to see farther and farther away. You know, the, the government had, uh, you know, all the governments have spending a huge amount of money, you know, the, with the satellite program, with the uh, space telescopes and so on. And uh, we want to be able to, you know, the, the, to capture more, you know, so, you know, we're able to do, you know, uh, many of these, uh, you know, uh, very deep measurements so that uh, we can you know, really understand the, uh, you know, the virus, you know, the uh, bacteria and so on. And we you know, also the, can uh, you know, communicate better because we can produce higher frequency uh, transistors that uh, allow us to be able to, you know, to have much, much higher speed communication. So these are the uh, you know, great advancements that pushed us into the, uh, into the technology and uh, capabilities 
and the enjoyment that we have today. You know, the, if, you know if, if someone told me when I was a child that uh, uh, people will be streaming videos, uh, you know, the, through the internet, and uh, you know that we can watch all these you know, high definition TVs. I would say, yeah, 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 that's just fantasy, right? Uh, but today we have exactly what it is, uh, what uh, you know, what that's, that's about. And um, started the 21st century, um, you know, we started to have a uh, a new paradigm, and this paradigm really started uh, in the last decade of the uh, 20th century. That is, we started to to be limited in you know how we can compute in terms of uh, how we can make advancement in, in uh, understanding and designing and creating uh, you know, the, the world. So we're, st we're starting to see computational models that allow us to see even farther, going back and forth in time, learn better, connect better, test hypotheses that cannot be verified any other way. So let me maybe uh, give you a kind of a, uh, a, a, a few examples that can compare and contrast what we have in the 20th century versus the 21st century. And um, uh, the first one is you know, the semiconductor manufacturing. In 20th century, we started uh, to fabricate uh, transistors in uh, an integrated circuit. There's a Nobel Prize you know, the, for Jack Kel Kelby for the invention of uh, you know, the um, integrated circuits and the Nobel Prize for you know, the, uh, you know, the, the several but no uh, Bell Lab you know, the, um, scientists for inventing the, uh, you know, the transistors. And uh, these two together uh, pretty much define the whole uh, semiconductor industry. And um, so the, we, we started to have a uh, you know, whole uh, sequence of shrinkage according to the Moore's law. And uh, we're able to produce smaller and smaller mass patterns that allow us to produce more and more transistors on the semiconductor chip. And uh, many of the of you are holding a cell phone with more transistors than uh, you know supercomputers that uh, we uh, we had when I was in college. But in the 21st century, the uh, the manufacturing of uh, you know semiconductors is no longer limited by the uh, optical capabilities that uh, we, you know, we can produce. In fact, the optical capabilities have already reached the end of a uh, wavelength. So we're pretty much using the patterns that are under the wavelength that we're using as light source to produce the semiconductors. So the started in the uh, uh, late 19, uh, you know, the uh, 20th century, uh, you know, all the manufacturers started to use optical proximity correction. Basically, uh, the light source, uh, you know, the, uh, the the pattern of the uh, the mask is computed uh, according to the optical model of uh, interference. So that um, you know, the, after the inter uh, the light hits the mask and before it hits the surface, uh, there uh, all the interference between the light uh, 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 pro uh, 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 optic uh, rays are modeled by the computing model and controlled through the mask pattern. So that uh, after the interference, the light uh, you know, the will uh, produce the correct transistor patterns on the surface. And um, uh, we, we recently had some conversation with the manufacturers and that they already see that the, the models that they use uh, you know, up to this point will stop working because the, uh, the transistors continue to shrink and uh, the, uh, the optical models that they're, uh, you know, they're, they're using is no longer sufficient in producing correct uh, you know, the patterns. So on the chip surface. So what they did need to do is they actually need to go back into the first principles of wave theory and use the wave uh, equations to be able to, the, to, uh, pre, uh, to control the patterns so that they can continue to go down to the deep submicron uh, uh, you know, the nanometer uh, you know, the production. The second uh, example is electronic microscope for chip debugging. It was a huge uh, breakthrough uh, when I was in college and grad school. Uh, basically, AMD uh, engineers at AMD and Intel uh, would use electronic microscope and they would cut the chip open and then uh, you know, start to, you know, the, to use mic uh, uh, the microscope to uh, physically you know, inspect the chip. 
and uh, figure out uh, where some of the uh, you know the misconnections and so on happen, and then uh, they can do the physical debugging uh, post uh, manufacturing debugging uh, for those chips. And uh, in the 21st century, uh, people started to use XCT X-ray uh, you know, computed tomography, and these are not the X-rays that you have you know, you you uh, you get. Uh, when you visit your dentist's office or a doctor's office, these uh, I'm going to show you more details later. And these are the high, you know, high energy physics-based X-ray sources that can uh, produce full chip uh, tomography, and um, uh, you can actually inspect all these layers of the chip without opening up the chip. And this is incredibly uh, uh, powerful and necessary for chips that are manufactured today. And uh, the, uh, you know, I have many, many other examples here. Uh, you know, the, in the 20th century, uh, we use MRIs and uh, ultrasounds to find internal growth or uh, breakage uh, in our tissue and so on. But in the 21st century, um, you know, we're beginning to see MRI uh, capabilities that are uh, doing what they call the metabolic imaging that will see the disease before visible anatomic change so that uh, it can be uh, predict the, uh, the, uh, the development of uh, stroke and um, uh, cancer and so on based on the metabolic level of the cell you know, uh, in the human body, right? These are purely, purely based on the, uh, the computational model and the sensing of the various chemical instances that are incredibly uh, you know, the, uh, light, small in terms of signal to noise ratio to be able to make these predictions. And uh, we have optical optics uh, uh, telescopes uh, you know, the, for astronomy uh, in the uh, 20th century. And now in the 21st century, we all know that uh, many, uh, you know, several Nobel prizes went to the uh, scientists who use gravitational wave telescopes, and which is uh, you know, heavily, heavily compute uh, uh, oriented uh, to be able to uh, verify some of the theory and have breakthroughs in astronomy. And uh, finally, for everyone's you know, the favorite uh, you know, the, uh, in the 20th century, we had GPS, and uh, uh, GPS saved many, many of the U.S. marriages because you know when these people drive on the road, uh, they get lost, and um, uh, you know the uh, you know the uh, the spouses argue whether they should stop stop at a gas station to ask for direction, and uh, invariably, uh, you know, the many of them uh, became uh, you know, uh, divorced uh, after the argument. But in the 21st century, you know, now we have self-driving cars. And that it's heavily, heavily depend on the, uh, the sensing, uh, you know, the capability. But as we all know, self-driving cars is fundamentally driven by the compute, uh, compute capability and uh, uh, in, the, uh, you know, uh, in, the, uh, in these vehicles. So uh, let me kind of dive a little bit deeper into the uh, you know, XCT case, because this is the, uh, the, um, the capability that I was personally involved and involves several of my uh, PhD students. Uh, the lead uh, student is uh, Mert Hideyehu Lu, and um, uh, he will be the lead student for the Pumps Summer School this year. So the, uh, some, some of you if, uh, will see him uh, you know, the virtually, uh, see him in these uh, classes you know, the, uh, if you come to some, uh, Pump Summer School uh, coming up next, uh, next month. And um, uh, we also, uh, another student of mine involved in this project is Simon Garcia de uh, Gonzalez, and uh, he is currently a postdoc at BSC. So many of you probably have you know, interacted with him uh, you know, the, um, you know, the, the recently uh, at BSC. So the, you know, the, we're going to, I'm going to kind of take you through uh, you know, the, uh, the technical, uh, technical breakthroughs that we are able to make through the efforts of PhD students. And uh, it's a, a joint effort uh, between Illinois and Argonne National Lab. And then uh, you will see that uh, this is a very big uh, team effort led uh, by a student. So um, you know, the, what is X-ray computed tomography or X-ray CT, XCT? Um, it's produced by uh, high energy light sources. So the, we're, uh, I'm showing one of the uh, light sources in the, in, uh, on, on the right side, which is the uh, Argonne National Lab. And um, uh, these are the uh, you know, acceler you know, the um, you know, uh, energy sources uh, driven by accelerators uh, you know, in, the, uh, you know, in the high energy physics labs. And then uh, uh, 
by accelerating particles and uh, uh, having collision, you, we can produce extremely high uh, energy and uh, pure uh, light to be used with the, as the uh, by source for X-ray. On the left hand side, uh, I show that uh, how the measurements are done. So the uh, you know you have the uh, X-ray source uh, on the uh, here, and then uh, the X-ray source will the, the will be sh will shoot through the sample, and uh, it will be uh, the the light will be detected after the, going through the uh, samples. Will be uh, there will be some deterioration of the signal, and then they will be uh, uh, received by the detector. So the the samples uh, will be you know the will be uh, uh, take, will be photo essentially uh, sam uh, the sample will be in inspected by uh, rotation so the uh, by rotating the sample we will be able to uh, get your know, slices of the picture that eventually can be used to reconstruct the physical details of the center uh, of the sample so the uh, there are many many studies that are uh, being done with these kind of technology uh, one is the molecular reactions. Now we all know that uh, uh, you know, many drugs, uh, you know, discovery and so on, use uh, molecular dynamic simulation, and many of these simulations need to be validated. So this kind of uh, you know, capability, uh, you know, uh, uh, imaging capability, can be used to validate molecular dynamics experiments, so that uh, we can have more uh, high high fidelity uh, you know, simulation with the molecular dynamics. And uh, uh, probably the most, uh, the kind of the most uh, visible application is the chip imaging. And uh, uh, essentially, we can uh, you know, uh, be, uh, we can inspect all the layers of the uh, semiconductor devices all the way down to submicron, you know, the, without uh, opening up, the, uh, uh, cutting open the chips or the you know grinding away layers of the chip, chips. So the so this is you know these are the kind of you know, the applications that uh, people use uh, for the uh, you know for this technology and um, XCT is such an important capability that uh, many many uh, you know, countries are uh, both collaborating and uh, and uh, competing with each other in building uh, better uh, more and more capable light sources so the uh, you know the, I'm showing the major uh, laboratories in the world and uh, uh, that uh, are ca capable of producing Producing uh, you know, the uh, light uh, lights and uh, producing XCT you know, the images. So the fundamentally, as I mentioned, uh, we have a uh, you know the sample uh, in the uh, in the uh, lower left corner here, and then the light sources will go through the sample and hit the uh, uh, the re uh, re uh, receivers or uh, you know, on the uh, left here. So uh, we will be producing what we call the sonogram uh, pictures from these sensors. So the sensors will have X, Y, Z, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the sensing, and also a theta, which is the uh, rotation angle of the, sen uh, you know, of the sample. Uh, so basically, we will produce this uh, sonogram uh, in these sensors. And um, uh, we will need to uh, use a estimation uh, you know, the, uh, equation to be able to reconstruct the original, uh, you know, the physical appearance of the center uh, through the reconstruction process. And this is a re inverse problem. It's a yield-defined inverse problem. And uh, uh, because of the resolution, um, we are talking about nanometer resolution. So even a very small sample will end up with a very large amount of data because the sensing needs to be done at extremely small scale. And uh, so the, the data that we're uh, getting in the, uh, you know, in the uh, sensors tend to be extremely large. And then uh, another important part is that uh, the sensors, even though uh, you know, we're talking about very advanced sensors, these sensors are still fundamentally CCD camera. And um, uh, they only have about 12 bits of accuracy, uh, precision, uh, or data accuracy. So the, uh, we can use this property to uh, you know, optimize for the, uh, the uh, communication and storage and so on of that data. So the, here is a uh, kind of an example of the uh, you know, of the data. So I'm talking about huge data, right? Uh, so uh, you know this is you know the, uh, getting closer to the huge data. So the uh, 
uh, here is a mouse brain data set. So the, it, it's a uh, it's a mouse brain uh, that uh, you know, being scanned uh, in this uh, in this environment, and um, uh, the the data set that uh, uh, we created for the sandalgram is about 1.87 terabytes. So this is the uh, you know the, the raw data that we get uh, you know from the sensors, and um, uh, we're going to need to create uh, recreate the uh, the three-dimensional you know, the uh, structure of the mouse brain, which is you know, the, uh, uh, depicted in the uh, dense matrix, which is about 4.69 terabytes. So there's already about the, uh, you know, the two to three times uh, increase in terms of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the data that we can, uh, we're going to get from the raw data into the useful data. And I'm going to come back to this point uh, later on. Um, you know, we we have a huge amount of uh, raw data in the world, but when we start to create useful data, which is the tomogram in this case, we typically would uh, blow up the data by several times, or so sometimes even order of magnitude. And this is where the big data re uh, revolution really is important. And then uh, we have the projection matrix. So the projection matrix is essentially you know, the reflection of our setup of the X-ray. So these are the projection matrices are essentially uh, uh, describing how each ray is going to, uh, where each ray is positioned and how these rays will you know, go through the space and hit the detectors. So the, and uh, these, uh, you know, the, uh, this projection matrix is um, there for some uh, you know, very important reason that I'll go into uh, later on. So if we look at the kind of the communic, uh, you know, the, uh, the the time that uh, we we spent on this kind of computation, and uh, this is a uh, coal, uh, you know, a, a shield coal study, and uh, uh, this is to study uh, clean energy uh, for uh, the kind of the, uh, the the clean energy for the rock. Uh, the uh, rock and coal uh, you know, mining. And then uh, he, the right hand side is the burning of the coal uh, in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, in, during the uh, energy production. So the, if we look at the amount of time that it takes uh, to be able to fully reconstruct uh, a sample like this, uh, you know, obviously the shale, uh, you know, the image is smaller than the, uh, the coal. And, uh, uh, so this has to do with the you know, the uh, the resolution you need for the study, and um, uh, so we have you know the wall time here, and you can see that the uh, as we use less and less precision, we can uh, you know dramatically reduce the time uh, needed for the communication, and uh, so for double precision, uh, you uh, after, uh, you know, uh, even without uh, optimization, the communication time and compute time are roughly comparable. But then uh, after the uh, GPU optimization, uh, we're able to dramatically reduce the, uh, the compute time. And this reflects the GPU capability in improvement in the past um, decade. Uh, when, when I started uh, with uh, GPU programming in 2010, uh, when David Kirk and I wrote the textbook, uh, the G80 had you know, the pretty good uh, compute throughput. But if you look at Ampere today, we're talking about somewhere around the 4,000 times improvement, right, in terms of compute throughput. So this uh, gives us the capability to just pretty much squash down the compute time that we need in order to reconstruct the image. However, if you look at the communication capability uh, in, the, uh, in the system, the InfiniBand, in the PCIe, and uh, so on, um, the communication you know, the time is actually not you know, the, uh, the has not improved uh, much at all. So the only real, uh, you know, the uh, kind of a, a, a big hammer that we have is the uh, precision representation of the data by exploiting the precision nature of the samples. Remember uh, each sample from the, uh, uh, the sensor only has about 12 bit of uh, precision. So we can use mixed precision, which we represent the, the data in, single, uh, in uh, half precision, and then uh, 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 do the computation in single precision. And uh, we can maintain the same level of uh, accuracy, but then we can squash down the communication cost. 
But if even this requires some very, very uh, deep, uh, uh, advanced optimization in terms of data partitioning and the communication skills uh, that I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So the, uh, the way that we, uh, you know, we, uh, we do the data partitioning is that uh, we do what we call the batch parallelism and the data parallelism. So the, uh, the batch parallelism has to do with the, the measurement. So the, remember, we had these you know, uh, angles of uh, sensing. So the, you know, when you have these you know, different angles, uh, you, know, the, uh, you have batches of measurement you know, the, in, the, uh, in, in, your, uh, in, in your data. So we can partition the measurement you know, the uh, data into batches and then uh, give each batch to a different uh, node uh, you know, for the processing. Unfortunately, uh, you, know, the, uh, you, you, uh, you whenever you do the batch parallelization, you need to replicate the uh, projection matrix uh, into the uh, into these nodes because uh, every uh, uh, image in uh, every batch will require the same projection and back projection. So that you will need to uh, replicate the uh, you know the projection ma uh, matrix which is a huge sparse matrix into the uh, you know into these nodes and you can also do the data parallelization you can you know have each node to only produce part of a uh, 3d uh, tomography of a picture so you can have multiple nodes together to produce the different parts of a picture unfortunately when you do the reconstruction if you use data parallelism well, the, uh, the, uh, the nodes will need to communicate with each other because the nodes will process the uh, sonogram data and can likely write into each other's uh, you know, data. So uh, that's why uh, we use a, what we call the gather process for these nodes to gather from their neighbors and um, uh, you know, the, the relevant contributions that their neighbors were making uh, to the part of the picture that each node is responsible for. So uh, one thing that uh, uh, is very, very important is that how we manage the uh, data in these sparse computations. So this is probably the first important uh, technical lesson uh, that we, uh, we learned uh, in this project. So the, uh, remember, we have the sparse matrix and we have the, uh, you know, the, which is the projection matrix. And these sparse matrices are really giving you the, uh, you know, the pre-computed uh, way of each ray that will hit in, uh, into the uh, into a pixel of the sample. So the, so there's a lot of physics pre-computed in this in this projection matrix. However, each ray is only going to touch a small part of the physical sample, right? Um, so the uh, so they will just go through the sample in a particular path. So there are only a small number of uh, sample uh, sample pixels that will be hit by a ray. So that's why this is a very sparse matrix. The matrix gives you the interaction of a particular ray with the sample pixels. So the, and, but we have a huge number of rays and uh, a huge number of pixels in the, uh, in, in the density. So we have a very sparse matrix. And uh, when we do the uh, uh, reconstruction, we're really doing a Sparse matrix, uh, matrix, uh, sparse matrix and dense matrix multiplication in each iteration. And um, so here is the layout of the dense part. Because the dense part is a 3D, uh, you know, it's a 3D representation, pixel representation of the sample. So every, in every uh, the matrix vector multiplication, uh, there will be a row of the original uh, sparse matrix and the column of the, uh, the, the, uh, the dense matrix that will be multiplied together. But because of the sparse nature, the dense matrix will be, uh, will be accessed in a spatially uh, oriented uh, way, not a, in the linear layout. So that's why uh, we need to do a Hilbert ordered domain decomposition. We order all the dense matrix elements according to the zigzag pattern of the Huber ordering, instead of the, or, uh, the traditional X first, Y second, and uh, Z third. We lay them out, and then we cut the, uh, you know, the pieces according to uh, Huber ordering rather than the uh, Cartesian ordering of the data. 
And so that when we do a ray, effectively, uh, when we do a matrix vector multiplication, it's a ray that goes through this dense matrix. And uh, because this reflects better about the physical, uh, the physical proximity of the data uh, that they represent, you will likely be able to hit all the pixels within the same partition. So this gives us the locality that we need in order to do, to do high performance computation. This makes a huge difference in terms of the communication cost and the GPU's ability to be able to process the data. So the, if you look at the Cartesian ordering versus the Hilbert ordering, uh, the locality is dramatically different in these sparse computations. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, when we are doing the, uh, the uh, projection and back projection, for each, uh, you know, the, for each uh, unit of the tom uh, tomogram, we need to go into the sonogram and collect the data, uh, effectively doing the uh, matrix vector multiplication and collect this part of the uh, data from the uh, sonogram. And then when we do the sonogram, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the sonogram, uh, you know, the, uh, we do the iteration comparison, we also need to do the back projection. So we see a similar access pattern. And these things reflect, uh, these you know, accesses benefit from the uh, Hilbert ordering. So then uh, another very, very important uh, part is this hierarchical communication. And this is becoming more and more and more important in uh, today's supercomputers. In today's supercomputers, we typically will have uh, multiple GPUs per node. And uh, uh, these multiple GPUs tend to be connected with, uh, at, uh, much, with much higher bandwidth and lower latency communication than the, uh, the uh, internode communication. So here we show that uh, uh, we, uh, we partition our sparse matrix and the dense matrix into these, you know, then, uh, into these GPUs in the same node. And um, uh, so I, I showed the, uh, the comp uh, Sort of the the, uh, the partitions, and um, uh, so each GPU is going to do a, a sparse computer, a, a full uh, the, the a full collection of rows of the uh, original uh, uh, or to, uh, arrays in the original uh, uh, sparse matrix, and interact with a part of the uh, you know the uh, the dense matrix, and then produce a uh, column of the result matrix. So then uh, they need to communicate with each other. So this is uh, you know, the, uh, what the state of the art communication uh, does. So the, each GPU will do the computation and now they have these results in their output sparse uh, you know, intermediate results. And, and these things cannot be represented densely because uh, if we uh, represent them densely, uh, they will be far exceed uh, the GPU memory. So they have to be represented in sparse. And then the sparse, you know, the uh, uh, node zero is only responsible for the zero uh, part of the dense. So basically you will need to take its one, two, three outcomes and then uh, send them to the node that uh, are responsible for these parts of the outcome and contribute to the final result. And this is what we call the gather process. Then um, you know the uh, uh, it, so we have a huge number of these you know inter uh, uh, communications within the node and also across the node, and um, uh, this is the reason why the communication time is so high uh, in the original uh, application. So what we did was that we uh, you know formulated a hierarchical communication method so that uh, each uh, you know uh, uh, each uh, uh, node has an internal communication. So if you see, uh, for example, um, you know, the, uh, the, the communication of node uh, of this GPU zero here to uh, let's say um, GPU two uh, in node one. And um, uh, so we have node, uh, it's GPU zero sending that, uh, that second part of the temporary result into that node, a GPU, and also that the other GPU also has a separate communication sending its contribution to the second part of the result into node uh, GPU two. So in the, in the hierarchical communication, what happens is that uh, you know, uh, both we 
explicit responsibility of communication uh, between these two nodes in uh, two GPUs in the same node. And so uh, here, GPU one will send its contribution of uh, into two to GPU one, and the GPU one will consolidate these two and send the result to eventually to GPU two. So this in, uh, intermediate communication happens within the node, and uh, in Summit, this is in uh, MV link, which is much much faster than InfiniBand. So we're able to uh, to uh, to use this intermediate communication to drastically reduce the communication time because the amount of time uh, uh, data that we need to send through the weak links is dramatically reduced. So the uh, and the data layout actually helps us to uh, to to be able to have most of the communication happen within the node. So this is very, very uh, interesting and non-intuitive. And this is one of the reasons why this paper won the best paper award in the uh, SD last year. So the, uh, if we look at the communication pattern, um, it's the, or the original way that the uh, Argonne National Lab used in their original implementation uh, requires a direct communication for this particular sample. This is a, one of the smaller uh, samples. Uh, 1.35 gigabytes of communication, and then you can see that the communication is you know all over the place uh, in the uh, in this original communication map. So the uh, once we did the hierarchical communication, the first step is the local communication. So these are the data that are sent through the local, and as you can see, the heat map is the intensity of the communication. So we are taking most of the heavy duty communication to inside the nodes now. And then uh, we do the uh, inside, uh, so uh, and, and uh, in, uh, inside the uh, multi-GPU node, right? And then uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we, uh, no, we think the socket, so the three GPUs in the same socket. And then uh, we exchange the uh, information within the same node across the two sockets in the same, uh, you know, uh, in the same node. And then eventually we take uh, the uh, the global communication where we sent us uh, sent uh, the information across the uh, infinite band to the uh, remote nodes. And even though these uh, data still are, are quite intensive, but remember these data are consolidated data. So these are very you know, uh, 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 very large packets that uh, tend to be much more efficient in using the infinite band. So with these optimizations. Uh, you know, we're, we're able to, you know, the, to drastically reduce the uh, the communication cost, you know, the uh, in, in uh, compared to the uh, the kind of the uh, the original direct approach. So if you look at the data sent in the uh, the global communication sent by the uh, direct method versus the hierarchical method, the uh, amount of information going through the, the slow links are dramatically reduced. So this is an example of the mouse brain, uh, you know, the reconstruction. So the, this one used to take hours, and um, uh, with all the uh, layout transformations and uh, uh, you know, the uh, low hierarchical communication and GPU optimization, uh, we're able to to have uh, uh, strong scaling, very good strong scaling, all the way down to about the 200, uh, 2,048 GPUs on summit. And um, uh, even 4,096 is still not bad in terms of the uh, you know the performance. So the, we just have a little bit of degradation in terms of scaling you know, the, when we go to, uh, all the way up to the full machine. This is the full size of the summit machine. So that we're able to uh, you know, uh, to use the locality and reduce enough of the global communication to be able to use, uh, fully utilize the machine. And this is the reconstructed pic uh, picture of the mouse brain. As you can see, that uh, we can actually have very, very accurate uh, you know, the, uh, 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 identification of all the blood vessels uh, in the mouse brain, and so this is extremely useful in studying the stroke you know, uh, uh, progression uh, in the uh, mouse uh, in the brain tissue. So the the work you know, took place in uh, two years. And uh, uh, Mertz did a summer internship at Argonne uh, National Lab to start the work. And then uh, you know, when he came back, we continued for another year uh, working with the Argonne uh, team. 
And uh, so eventually we submitted uh, the paper to SD last year and we won the best paper award. And then uh, MERT also won the student research competition award. And um, uh, so th this is, you know, the, uh, I think, you know, one of the, uh, the, the most uh, recognized PhD uh, uh, work that uh, I have supervised to date. So the, you know, the, I think I, uh, I wanted to just kind of uh, say a few things about this. So when you pick, you know, select your PhD research, right? Um, you know, there are many, many uh, decisions you need to make. And uh, uh, you also need to decide, you know, what's important uh, for you in, in, in terms of you know, the, what, what you can accomplish in your PhD research. Um, you know, the factors that I typically think about for my students is one, um, you know, is this intellectually um, you know, challenging? Is, is, you know, is the problem intellectually challenging? Is there enough of the hard problems in the, uh, in the research that would uh, truly you know, use a uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, very, very intelligent person right, for many years? And the second one is, if you're wildly successful, right? If you're extremely successful in your project, is there anyone who will care? And uh, is there going to be, you know, is this project going to make a big impact on, you know, some part of the world, right? And the third one is, you know, the uh, when when you, you know, the, uh, when you are very successful, and um, uh, you know, would you be able to advance, you know, other um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the state of the art for other researchers and, uh, you know, or even, uh, you know, uh, everyday life of the uh, people. So, the, you know, some of the tech, with some of the techniques that you develop, be able to, uh, uh, will be uh, uh, applicable or the, you know, the, uh, useful for people who are doing other projects. So, the, you know, if you think through these things and pick the right project, and uh, work really, really hard on it. I, I feel that many of you will have you know the same level of success uh, you know as Mert in uh, this project. So the, I want to just spend a few minutes to kind of uh, you know, to just talk a little bit about uh, some of the things we learned. Uh, you know, not just from this project, but uh, from the past five years of uh, you know our work in the IBM uh, Illinois Center. And um, uh, you know, so that uh, you know, uh, hopefully I'll give you a little bit of a sense about how I think the, uh, the computing systems will evolve uh, in the next decade. And, uh, uh, and my prediction is uh, these systems will look very, very different than they look today. And uh, many of, I'm hoping that many of you will be contributing to these changes and um, uh, with your PhD work. And um, hopefully, um, you know, many of you will be, you know, the, will, will be, uh, you know, the, um, the kind of the, uh, the will build your career out of the successful PhD projects along these paths. So the um, the the way that we're seeing today is that um, uh, you know, the compute is now uh, really beginning to be engaged with uh, you know, very large amount of raw data, and this is nothing new. You know, the people predicted that uh, you know this uh, you know, phenomenon. Uh, Quite a few years ago, about uh, started about 15 years ago, people started to talk about big data and so on. And when people talk about big data, people typically uh, talk about the raw data. So you know the uh, you know we you know we we look at the uh, the uh, sonogram the uh, son, uh, sinogram data, and that was the raw data that we received from the sensors. So in astronomy, we have huge amount of raw data. And uh, you know we have in uh, social media, in uh, you know e-commerce, e we have you know a huge, huge amount of raw data that is being you know, stored in the industry. And these data are petabytes in size and growing. The interesting part is that uh, you know in many ways this raw data is actually not the, the worst challenge for computing systems today. The reason is when we you know, the access these raw data, we tend to access them sequentially. And uh, so the, you know, the, we, we tend to have some, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, some local uh, sort of a, a sequentialized way of scanning through our raw data because you know, we don't know much about the raw data. So we need to kind of scan through the data to get a value out of it. For example, uh, you know, many of these companies are doing uh, recommender systems based on their raw customer data. And uh, the raw customer data tend to be you know, the, uh, used in training of uh, large models and the training process tend to be sequential. 
uh, no, with some shuffling and so on, but uh, they still tend to be largely sequential. Uh, sorry, I have this timing thing. So then, the, uh, so the, the interesting part to me is, you know, what we call the knowledge and model data up here. And these data are what we, uh, we derive from the raw data with compute. So the, an example that uh, I just went through is the, um, you know, the tomogram data that we uh, reconstructed from the, uh, the raw data and also the, uh, the projection matrix that we, you know, we use in that construction. So the projection uh, represents the knowledge that we have uh, about converting from raw data into uh, you know, uh, structured knowledge data. And these kind of things are very, very important and they're becoming bigger and bigger in our world. So the, uh, you know, the knowledge and model data tend to be terabytes plus in sizes and growing and they're uh, sparsely accessed and updated based on compute. So the, this is the reason why our concurrent computing systems are not properly or adequately designed. And the, our data, uh, you know, the, the computing systems are mostly designed to, have to be able to access these knowledge and model data uh, in the memory, in the DRAM. And um, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, as we begin to engage in real usage, as companies begin to really engage in, uh, the, with millions and millions of customers, the knowledge and model data become so big that the, uh, they all exceed the DRAM capacity of our uh, you know, the machine. So the, uh, the training uh, process takes the raw data and, uh, and uh, updates our knowledge and model data. And that will be a uh, you know, sparse update into the knowledge. And then uh, in some cases, when we have raw data, uh, that's let's say live customer sessions, the raw data come in and what we be, need to sparsely access the, um, the uh, knowledge data to be able to make the recommendation and that will be a sparse read access into the data. So, the, so why is our traditional computing systems not sufficiently uh, you know, designed? So the, this is kind of a, a, a very much simplified picture about the, uh, the problem. The problem is that uh, uh, you know, we typically, uh, when, when we uh, use uh, access sparse data, I'm showing the you know, kind of these uh, red dots in the storage that represent the, uh, you know, where we can find useful data. And they're embedded in a, a very large amount of uh, data. So this is why we, we need to do the sparse access. And then, uh, so the, in the traditional way, what we do is we would uh, do a memory map of these huge files. And then, uh, you know, so we would uh, access the, uh, this data. But then, uh, as, uh, you know, since they're still in the storage, we'll have a, a page miss in the, uh, in, in the memory, uh, in, in the GPU memory or in the host memory for that matter. And then the, uh, the, the page fault will go and bring in a page of data that contain these hot data. The problem is, the problem is that uh, uh, you know, with the, uh, the access to the storage is of low latency. So uh, you know, for every access, you know, the, in order to tolerate latency, we really need to bring a big chunk of data to make the access worthwhile. But whenever we bring a big chunk of data, we oftentimes will bring all the data along with the useful data. And so we bring a huge amount of data for a very few, uh, the small portion of uh, usage, uh, useful data in these transfers. So the, uh, and to make it even worse, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, access is controlled, initiated, and directed by the CPU using page fault handler. And this is a very sequential and uh, very uh, high software overhead process that uh, makes the whole uh, system uh, extremely slow. So, that, uh, so this is the reason why when we process huge data in the GPU today, uh, we have a wall around it. And this wall essentially has a very small, um, you know, the small aperture into the storage controlled by the CPU. And uh, uh, the, the CPU would just bring in this box of data into the GPU with very uh, small portion of useful data uh, in that process. And uh, we see this again and again in both communication and uh, uh, storage access uh, in, the, uh, in our systems. 
So uh, the, uh, about two uh, two years ago, uh, you know, we uh, proposed a project uh, at the IBM Center called BAPS. And um, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm not go, going to go into the the, the acronym. Uh, it's a, a grad student uh, name, and uh, it, it it may not be uh, very appropriate, uh, you know, for a public recording. So, but just call it BAS. And um, uh, the idea is that um, uh, you know, instead of using the traditional memory maps, you know, let's just treat the GPU. Uh, let's just treat the G, uh, you know, the uh, the data as memory data. And then uh, we just you know, allow the GPU to be able to directly issue accesses into the storage through the MEME uh, you know, interface. And uh, so that we can do fine-grained, um, you know, the uh, uh, much smaller than page size accesses into the storage. And um, uh, so we enable this access and also we enable uh, zero copy, you know, very high uh, throughput access into the GPU memory and the CPU memory. So uh, we uh, make the access, uh, access request into a dedicated user level process uh, at the, uh, to, uh, in the BAF, uh, in the uh, CPU, and then uh, submit the physical accesses much, much faster. We're talking about hundreds of times faster, 2,000 times faster than the, uh, the kernel uh, page fault handler. And then we can bring in these you know, the, uh, fine granularity accesses that have mostly useful data into the GPU. And this gives us very high uh, IOPS and fine grain transfer and so on. And this also requires a very uh, different design in the storage store, uh, structure. So the, you know, where, uh, the, um, as you can probably uh, guess, you know, the, uh, my team at NVIDIA is uh, you know, building uh, future systems based on this model. And uh, uh, hopefully we will be able to, you know, the, to uh, revolutionize the, uh, the handling of very, very large data, very sparse access into the data and enable and introduce enough parallelism into the uh, process. And we, we all know that GPUs are good compute devices because of its parallelism, because it's way, its ability to tolerate uh, memory latency today. And uh, we're uh, predicting that the GPUs will become the dominating devices for processing uh, huge sparse data in the future because of its you know, vast amount of parallelism. And you can expect to see even more parallelism from GPUs in the future because of these needs. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude the talk and hopefully we still have a you know, little bit of time for questions. So the, you know, the, um, you know, the, I, uh, I can, you know, the Maria or the, you know, the, we can look at the, if there are questions or the uh, student and faculty can also ask uh, questions why. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, a big virtual applause <laughs> because it's difficult to, thank, to you. Say thank you this way. So now it's time for, for questions. Um, it would be easy if everybody writes uh, the question in the chat or um, uh, we can also open the micro if uh, uh, you prefer it. Uh, so questions yeah, we are a lot of people so it's very difficult to see all of you with the raising hands mechanism so that's why i ask you to write your name or your question in the chat is there any question If there is no question, uh, the only thing is to, to thank one May again for uh, this wide uh, explanation and interpretation on what has happened and, 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 and why and, and your vision on, on, on the future and, and how to approach it. So uh, thank you very much. Huh? Thank you. Thanks. So now it's time for the... Uh, oh. Oh. Sorry, can, uh, can I say something? Of course, of course, Matteo. Uh, sorry, I, Mateo. I five minutes before because I am with a uh, uh, <laughs> very difficult problem. So, well, May, thank you once more because you are a really a friend of Barcelona, UPC, and uh, BSC, and you demonstrate that uh, at every moment, okay? Uh, um, for what I heard last, the last five minutes, 
uh, you are doing as usual a very good work so uh, as you know you can uh, discuss with John I think John is there or Jesus we are I don't know how many of the people as you know we are developing uh, hardware for uh, uh, future mm -hmm. uh, uh, accelerator okay so we our approach is uh, vector architecture but uh, we are uh, uh, spending special attention to the sparse matrices so i think i don't i don't know because i arrived late but i think we need to communicate each other just to see as usual how we can collaborate with you okay what are the best mar and then how our architecture can can adapt to the the thing you are you are doing okay and uh the regards to the family okay abc Thank Amanda, you. Yeah. Brian, carissa and <laughs> amanda the family amanda we, we are uh, missing you here, okay? Yep. Thank you very much. Wendy. Thank you, Matteo. Okay, thank you.